Hi guys, my name is Ming. I'm a professional chef and major kitchen nerd. On this show, I'm going to share with you some of the many tips and tricks I've learned over the years. Now, before we get into cooking, I think it's essential to talk about what you need in your kitchen. What are the very essential cooking utensils you require? What about pots, pans, powered appliances? I'm going to give you the lowdown on all this today. Right, let's talk about pots and pans and what's essential. In general, you only need three categories. Something to boil things in, something to stir things in, and something to fry things in. If you cover these three categories, you should be fine. First up, your boiling pot. This is the largest pot in your entire arsenal of pots and pans. You want this to be quite wide and quite tall, generally to hold a fair amount of liquid. You're boiling things in this. You're making soups, stocks, porridge. Next up, we have the sauce pot. Now the defining factor here is it's got a nice long handle and it's relatively deep. Because you're going to be stirring things in this, this is perfect for sauces and ideal uh, for instant noodles as well as scrambled eggs. Right, on to frying pans. I have three frying pans here of differing types of materials. Do I need all three? No, you don't. This is the first kind. This is a thin, light, non-stick frying pan. I don't recommend these pans for some reasons. First, they're not actually that cheap. And number two, they don't retain a lot of heat because they're so thin. When you try and cook in these, the heat from the pan is immediately transferred to the food, and then you don't get that temperature difference that colors your food nicely. The only benefit they have going for them is that they are quite light. The pan I do recommend is the heavy-bottomed non-stick frying pan. Hear that? That's thicker metal. Now, this is still a non-stick pan, so you gotta treat it with care. Pro tip here, you can find some very, very good quality heavy bottom non-stick frying pans at a certain large furniture store that has the uh, color scheme of yellow and blue. And finally, the third kind of frying pan. It is not an essential item, but it is extremely useful and I want to talk about it. This is cast iron. This is the heaviest of all. The thick, heavy gauge metal retains a lot of heat. So if you're looking to crisp up a steak, sear it really hard. This is the pan you use to transfer a good amount of heat into the meat. Of the three types of frying pans, if I had to pick one, I would always go for a nice, good quality, heavy-bottomed, non-stick frying pan. Splurge on this a little bit, it will last you a long time, if you take care of it properly. These are cleaning sponges and cleaning things. What are the differences between these? First up, yellow and dark green. This is abrasive. Never, never use this on a non-stick frying pan. Never. Don't use it. Don't do it. If you do, this is what you get. You end up stripping all of the non-stick coating and the pan becomes uh, stick. What you do want to use on non-stick pans are these. These are also slightly abrasive, but they're not made with materials that are harder than the non-stick coating. This is basically a plastic brush that has a little bit more texture. You can use these on non-stick pans. Just make sure you're gentle and you're removing food and not the surface of the non-stick coating. This is a coconut husk brush. When I was young, my dad used to tell me that my hair was like this. The specific phrase he used was Pao Yu is hat, which means a uh, abalone brush. Pao Yu is hat is the best brush for a non-stick. It doesn't scratch, but the bristles are nice and heavy duty. So you can really go to town and remove all sorts of gunk that is caked up and burnt on your pen. Now when you're first starting out in a kitchen, right, you don't want to spend too much money. You don't want to fill it up with appliances you may or may not use. So these three, to me, are the most essential, very useful, and give you a whole bunch of fun things you can already do. This is an air fryer. An air fryer is essentially a small oven. Right? It heats up a small compartment and forces it full of very hot air. And uh, whatever's inside there gets crispy, gets cooked very fast. So this drawer is the compartment and you've got this little basket. And you put your items there, you can put some foil in it. So I love to use this for things like reheating fried chicken, roasted pork. Anything that needs dry heat, uh, this does very well and does very, very quickly. Next up, we're talking about rice cookers. Rice cookers help you make rice in a perfect quality uh, every single time. Another pro tip with the rice cooker is that you can do a whole bunch of things in it as well. As you cook your rice, you can cook meats on top, you can cook vegetables, all the flavour drips into the rice. You can make soups, you can make stocks in this, you can make porridge in a rice cooker. The possibilities are endless. Right, so the next piece of equipment that I think is essential, crucial, 
This is a little bit unorthodox, but trust me when I say this is going to save you so much headache, so much stress, it's going to make cleanup so much easier as well. The item I'm talking about is the stick blender. Right, so this stick blender has a motor attachment, and depending on what head you put onto this attachment, gives you a lot of capabilities. Right now, this is the blender attachment, and if I stuck this into a pot of soup, I could turn this on, and before you know it, I got pumpkin soup, I got cream of mushroom soup, I got a roasted tomato soup, I got all sorts of soups. See, I didn't want to use just my hands to whisk up like a whole batch of meringues or egg whites. This baby, I can turn on, whisk, 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 whisk. And I have a nice fluffy batch of meringues uh, in, you know, like a third of the time. So motorized whisk. And the final attachment that I have here is this little container. I can connect this jug to the motor. And what I essentially have here is a mini food processor. Blender attachment, food processor. What is the difference between these two and why are they essential? Blending is essentially taking a solid and turning that into a liquid. You want gloopy texture, you want it soft and flowy. Chopping, this is also known as food processing. You want to chop that up very fine, you want to mince it, but you don't want to turn it into soup. So they're two separate things, and this one appliance gives you these two functions, albeit in a rather basic fashion. Essentials for prep. Before you cook, you gotta prepare stuff. Cutting boards. What do you need? What's essential? I always advocate having at least two boards so that you can use one for raw food and one for cooked food or fresh vegetables and fruits. A small board is very useful, it's easy to clean and wipe off and it's very light. My favourite board of all is a large wood board. In a lot of kitchens, this is where a lot of food is, is plated and finished. Make sure that your main board has enough space so that as you're cutting, you don't crowd yourself. Main board needs to be big, put a hand down, knife down comfortably. If your board is too small, the chance of you cutting yourself increases a lot more. So, chef's knife. This does 95% of all my work. I have a curved edge, this fits my hand nicely. Paring knife. Small knife for smaller jobs. Small cutting. And together, these two knives will be about 99% of all you need. More prep essentials as you cook. Spoons. Teaspoons and tablespoons. Incredibly useful for all your needs. Tasting, scooping ingredients. This is called a strainer. Very self-explanatory. Very useful. Tongs for handling raw meats or handling cooked items. I like two types. A more durable, heavy-duty metal version and one that has a rubber tip so that when I'm stirring things in a non-stick pan, I don't scratch it. The whisk. Very useful for stirring sauces, breaking up bits of things. Wooden utensils. These are great. They don't scratch things and they're very durable and hardy. Two types here. One that has a flat edge. Let me scrape a pan better. And another that is a round spoon. See the profiles? Different usage. Both essential. A ladle. A ladle is always great. You need something to pick up larger amounts of liquids. One of my favourite pieces of equipment of all, the rubber or silicon spatula. Now these can be obtained online very, very affordably and they're incredibly useful for stirring things without scratching pans, for mixing things together and for scraping out bowls because they conform. Which means every nook and cranny is accessible to you. You don't waste anything and cleanup is easier as well. General prep essentials. Can opener. There are many kinds. You want two things. Look out for the bit, the part that bites into the can to be metal. And you want it to be as sturdy as possible because cans are these tough things. Peelers. Obviously, you use them for fruits, for vegetables. Get a durable one, pay a little bit more. This is metal and it's Japanese. The last thing on my prep list is probably the most essential. These are mixing bowls. They can come in plastic, ceramic, metal. I like metal because they're almost indestructible. The absolute bare minimum that I recommend is two sizes, small and large. The large ones are great for mixing things in, for tossing salads, for preparing food items. The small ones are great for holding condiments after you've prepared them or for sealing and putting things into the fridge uh, to marinate for a while. In total, maybe two large bowls and four or five small bowls. So a lot of you are going to ask, why can't I just use my regular serving bowls? You can, but they're not durable and they will break eventually. Metal bowls, on the other hand, are lighter, more durable, and they don't break. 
Using metal bowls for prep will reduce the wear and tear on your pretty, gorgeous serving bowls. And they'll help you organize your cooking too. Okay, before we end this episode, I want to talk a little bit about single-use items, things that you can only use for one purpose. A lot of these are quite affordable, and they come with videos, you see them online, they look kind of compelling, they do pretty amazing things. I've got three of them here, and we're going to evaluate how effective they are. What are these items going up against? They're going up against my trusty knife. So the objective of this watermelon cutter is to make watermelon cubes. And then the next thing is I take this and I... <laughs> oh wow. That, that was actually quite easy. It worked. I wouldn't call these cubes though. They're kind of like watermelon tiles. I gotta say this is quite impressive. It's relatively quick. The end piece looks a little bit misshapen. It's like it's just punching it off the side of the watermelon. So out of one, two, three, four pieces, there's always one wonky looking piece. Uh, but the rest are acceptable. But I think my main problem with this is there's a fair amount of wastage. Because of the curved edge of the watermelon, I'm gonna have to avoid some sections. If not, I will start to scoop up parts of the, the peel of the watermelon. Right, let's see how this works out with a knife. To me, with a knife, a watermelon cube looks like a cube. Straight cut edges, nice and clean. I haven't sort of juiced the watermelon by pushing an implement through it. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this, but there is an obvious color difference to me. With the watermelon windmill, the slices of watermelon look a bit darker. You have basically got these juicy raw edges. And I'm guessing that that's because the mouth of the tool is not quite as sharp as a knife. It's just a piece of metal. You're pushing this little bit of metal through the watermelon and basically rupturing all the little watermelon cells. I'm not sure this watermelon will keep so well because all this is oxidizing and gonna get soft in a couple of hours. This is a clear win for the knife. Don't buy a watermelon slicer like that, please. Apple slicer. Align this bit around the core of the apple. <laughs> Okay, and a couple of larger pieces of apple that have some core stuck on them. Uh, but all in all, that was quite quick. Check out the amount of wastage. This is the core amount that I took off from the apple, and this is what the, the apple slicer took off. I'm sure there's a fair amount of meat here to be had, but I'll give you this, okay? The apple slicer was quick. This thing takes up a fair amount of space, and unless you're cutting apples all day, you might use this once or twice for the novelty and then get stuck in your drawer and then you never see it again. Our last item for today is a garlic press. Now I've actually used these before and I find them relatively effective and I want to show you why they are actually quite decent to use. Take your peeled garlic, put it in there and give it a press. So a garlic press is primarily there to help you mince garlic quite quickly. Out comes the unpressed stuff. So there's quite a fair amount of wastage with the garlic press. Right, I'm gonna show you how we would do it with a knife. As you can see, this is taking a fair bit more time than if I were to use the garlic press. Two cloves, about the same size, but a lot more yield using a knife because there's no wastage. Everything got sliced up and cut. And if you take a closer look at the texture of the minced garlic, you'll see a couple of things as well. First, with the minced garlic that was squeezed out of the garlic press, it's altogether more wet and juicy. Now, this has been pulped almost, right? So what that means is a lot of the aromatics, the oils, the flavors are out now and they're apparent. So if you threw that into a stew or you sauteed that up, the flavors of garlic will be very pungent and very apparent, very upfront. Whereas, because I used my knife, which is considerably sharper, my minced garlic with my knife is much drier. Knives are the essential items in the kitchen, so I would rather level up and get better at using a knife overall, whereas these single-use items are meant for one thing only. That's all for this episode. I hope you learned something about the essential equipment that you need to have within your kitchen. Don't forget to click like, subscribe, and hit that bell so that you get notified every time we post a new video. Alternatively, you can download the Click Network app and you can watch our videos there. I'll see you in the next episode.